Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Clarence. I am genuinely moved, and uh, I didn't want you to stop. It was really, you know, it was really that lovely. As King Henry VIII said to each of his six wives, don't worry, I won't keep you long. Um, <laughs> speaking of six wives, that would be the total number accumulated in the proposed Republican ticket of Donald Trump and Newt Gingrich. I don't know if you get into the parsing of the second lady, third wife. I, I don't, you know, it, it's sort of a new territory. But I have to admit that I am kind of rooting for Newt, even though I disagree with him on 11 out of 10 issues. And the reason is that I'm tired of covering candidates with 28-inch waists, perfectly tailored suits, perfectly coiffed hair, never sweat, never have a cavity. Newt is overweight. I identify with that. There is a foolproof test to know <clears throat> if you are overweight. That is, if you're sitting in the bathtub and the water level in the toilet starts to rise. <laughs> it's happened. Speaking of the speaker, we meet tonight in the shadow of the Capitol, where the Congress, frankly, has fallen to new lows in popular support. According to the Gallup poll, public approval of the Congress the job rating had fallen to 11 percent. 11 percent approval. Arizona Senator John McCain, upon seeing those Gallup numbers, said this. When you're at 11% approval, it means you're down to staff and blood relatives. <laughs> exactly two months later, the approval rating of Congress had fallen in Gallup from 11% down to 7%. I talked to John McCain, and he reported that his 104-year-old mother, Roberta, had called him. He said, we're now down to staff. <laughs> we kid a lot about Congress, but let's be fair. Congress does serve two enormously important purposes. First, Congress makes the United Nations look ruthlessly efficient. <laughs> and second, by comparison, Congress makes any president's job rating look terrific. And thinking about this campaign, and how can you not, last week's Democratic primary in Kentucky was really close. Secretary Clinton defeated Senator Sanders by just a single percentage point. Asked for his reaction to the results, Bernie Sanders thundered, there it is again, Clinton and that damn 1%. <laughs> I, I, for one, identify with Bernie's campaign platform. Control Wall Street, raise the minimum wage, repeal Citizens United. Now get the hell off my lawn. <laughs> Both the Trent Pump and Clinton campaigns appear to have hit on the identical same slogan. Vote for me because I am not that other guy. Times like this, I miss the fun presidential campaigns of the past. Clarence and I were lucky enough to cover. I remember when the late comedian Pat Paulson ran for president. He was a delight, he really was. And he explained, he explained his candidacy one day this way. I've been asked, said Pat Paulson, why I put my life on hold to run for president. Is it love of country? Is it out of concern for the well-being of my fellow Americans? Or is it for the private jets? the limos, the girls. The answers are no, no, yes, yes, yes. Those in the room 
who are concerned about Donald Trump actually winning in November, please do not be anxious. Given his track record, it would only be a matter of months after his inaugural before President Trump would leave the United States for a much younger country. <laughs> if Hillary Clinton is elected in November, consider what that would mean. Bill Clinton in the White House all day with nothing to do. <laughs> As Clarence noted, up until 1979, I had never worked on or for a newspaper. I had worked in four presidential campaigns, the Senator Robert Kennedy, Senator Edmund Muskie, the Senator for Representative Mo Udall of Arizona, and for vice presidential nominee, Sergeant Shriver in 1972. All good and honorable men, uh, all superior to the people who beat him. Uh, but my, uh, my principal literary contribution at that point was writing concession speeches. <laughs> and Meg Greenfield, the editor of the editorial page of the Washington Post, usually a woman of uncommon good judgment, invited me to lunch and offered me a job as an editorial writer and a once a week columnist. What an undeserved stroke of good luck for me. Then I got a very second, a second very lucky break. My office on the fifth floor of the Washington Post overlooking 15th Street Northwest was right next to the offices, the suite, the Warren, call it what you want, of Herb Block the legendary editorial page cartoonist of the Post. From 1979 to 1981, I was Herb Block's next door neighbor. What good fortune. What a professional record he wrote. 55 years at the Post, three Pulitzer Prizes. Personally, a fourth he shared for the Post's Watergate coverage with editorial writer Roger Wilkins and a couple of young upstart reporters named Bernstein and Woodward. For nearly six decades, he stood up to bullies and to dictators. He exposed hypocrites and liars. On February 9th, 1950, and let me tell you, Herb Block was fearless. On February 9th, 1950, in Wheeling, West Virginia, a junior senator from Wisconsin told a Lincoln Day dinner of the Ohio County Republican Party, I have in my hand a list of 205 members of the Communist Party who are working the State Department of the United States. The numbers would change. There were 57 one day, 81 another, 205. But Joe McCarthy had begun his fear-spreading campaign of red baiting, intimidating the political world, and effectively neutralizing the next Republican president, the nation's hero of World War II, Dwight Eisenhower. But that March, just three weeks, three weeks after McCarthy hit like a storm, there was the cartoon that would capture exactly the infection in you know, our body politic that McCarthy represented. A, the Republican elephant being pushed and coaxed by a group of Republican leaders toward a very shaky Republican platform, which was teetering on top of 11 buckets of tar. On those buckets was written, for the first time anywhere, McCarthyism. And it entered the language. And I think it's fair to say, Joe McCarthy never would have fallen, but for Herb Bullock's leadership. Herb won the Pulitzer Prize for that, he was fearless. 52, the publisher of the Post was Philip Graham, a strong and confident man who supported Republican Dwight Eisenhower for president. The editorial page of the Post endorsed Dwight Eisenhower for president. But the editorial cartoonist, Herb Block, did not. Herb preferred, admired, supported Governor Adlai Stevenson of Illinois, the Democrat. Herb's cartoons were there as clear and crystal and strong 
speaking for Stevenson as the paper supported Eisenhower. Finally, it reached the point where Mr. Graham pulled Herb's cartoons from the post. But they continued to run in other papers around the country and taunted by competing papers in the Washington market when we still had those things. Uh, Mr. Graham saw the wisdom, re relented, and returned Herb to his proper space. He was fearless. He was independent. That was Herb. At many newspapers, as we mentioned earlier, the editorial page cartoonists reflected and echoed the point of view of the editorial page editors and the publisher. I see Bob Asher here tonight, my former colleague, the editorial staff. We had daily meetings at the Washington Post to discuss editorials and position and who would write what during my years at the Post. Never once did Herb Block ever come to one of those editorial meetings. <laughs> he was independent. He did, not re he did not report up. He, he looked down for his information. He was a great journalist, always reporting, collecting information and facts and background and history, researcher. He was a one-man search engine. He really was. It was just remarkable. And he'd ask reporters, young reporters, rookie reporters, whether his take on it was right, and don't hesitate to tell him if he was wrong. He did not seek the approval, or the opinion even, of the editors or publishers. But about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Herb would come out of his office, and what an office it was full of papers and books and wind-up toys, a couch and refrigerator, and just fun, just fun. I think that the original TV pilot of The Hoarders may well have been inspired <laughs> by Herb Block's office. Audi would come in his much-traveled and lived-in Pendleton plaid shirt. He would be carrying a handful of sketches, one of which would end up on the next day's editorial page. Then Herb Block would elevate your self-esteem through the ceiling by asking him, he might bother you for a minute and ask your opinion about which one of the cartoons you thought worked. He asked Greenhorn reporters, he valued their approval and opinions. But he did not bother to seek the approbation of those above him in the chain of command. He answered only to his conscience and his own integrity, both of which were formidable. Somebody, it was either Dante or Tom DeLay. <laughs> said the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a time of moral crisis remain neutral. Herb was never neutral. Herb's first cartoon taking on and exposing Adolf Hitler appeared in 1932. That was before the Fuhrer was even the Fuhrer. He wasn't even in office. Herb stood up to bullies and brutes and dictators everywhere. He was an environmentalist before there were environmentalists. In 1935, Herb's primeval, the forest primeval call, uh, cartoon of tree stumps leveled by uh, lumber company's greed uh, just captured what was going on in the United States. The Post editorial page supported the United States war in Vietnam. Her block opposed the United States war in Vietnam. He took on the tobacco company, the gun lobby. He was a strong, compelling voice for civil rights and against segregation. But let me tell you about Herb Block, my next door neighbor, a lifelong bachelor Herb liked the ladies, and the ladies, I can testify, very much liked Herb. <laughs> <clears throat> he was a total stranger to self-importance. He was kind. He was never one of those liberals who love mankind, but really don't like people very much. <laughs> Occasionally, the fun-loving Herb, Herb would come out of his office with a helmet on his head, and on top of that helmet was a blinking light to indicate Herb had a good idea. <laughs> I 
Herb talked to everybody. Two of his favorites were Joyce and Margot, the two telephone operators, wonderful telephone operators in the newsroom of the Washington Post. He was just a remarkable man. He was independent, fearless, he was kind. He received the Medal of Freedom from President Bill Clinton. It did not stop Herb for a second. <laughs> there he was cartooning the philandering president later with his trousers down around his ankles. <laughs> he was just a remarkable, remarkable man. And I think of this year, and we all do of time, what would Herb do? What would he do, a campaign a candidate whose campaign song has to be, we shall overcome? <laughs> Who boasts and brags about his business success and refuses to disclose his taxes. Can you imagine Herb on that? who lied publicly and repeatedly about the President of the United States and his birth certificate, what would Herb do? Wow, I can only think about it. But I have to say that Herb, at the core, was an optimist. He believed in this country. He was a fierce patriot. He believed that, I believe, and I hope I'm not speaking for him, that politics, and I don't pretend to, is nothing more and nothing less than the peaceable resolution of conflict among legitimate competing interests. And I don't know in a nation, a continental nation, as big and brawling and diverse as ours, how else would resolve our differences except to the care, the commitment, and yes, the passion of the political process. I pray it never comes down to our settling our differences or resolving them by money, on numbers, on muscle, but always, I hope, through the commitment and the imagination and the dedication of those in the public life. I like people who run for political office. For most of us, life is a series of quiet successes, quiet failures. If you and I are the two finalists to be the regional sales manager of the Great Lakes Coat Hanger Company, and you get the job and I don't, when the local paper announces your promotion and good luck, they don't add that Shields was passed over because of lingering doubts about his expense account or, <laughs> or his erratic behavior at the company Christmas party. <laughs> but when you run for office and you put your name out there, it's there for everybody you ever sat next to in study hall, the babysat for, or double dated with, to know whether you won the more likely you lost. I've always admired candidates who could lose with grace and particularly with humor. In my half century covering politics, I've never seen anybody do it better than a fellow named Dick Tuck, who lost a state senate campaign in Los Angeles by just a handful of votes. And when the vote was announced, a radio reporter from KMPC in Los Angeles stuck a microphone in front of his face. He said, how do you feel, Mr. Tuck? And Dick Tuck answered, the people have spoken, the bastards. <laughs> But most of all, I admire political courage. The first time I ever slept in the same quarters with African Americans, or took orders as a regular course from African Americans, was at Paris Island, South Carolina, in Marine Corps boot camp. And the only reason I did that was because a man from Missouri, brought up in a segregationist society, named Harry Truman, stood up in 1948 as he's running for re-election and said, it is unacceptable and literally un-American to ask people to fight and possibly die for their country and to segregate them by race. I admired, too, the courage of Ronald Reagan, who was about to make his last run for the presidency. Reagan had run in 1968, briefly against Richard Nixon, and not won the nomination. 76 had gone the distance against Jerry Ford and Ford won at the Kansas City Convention. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was going to be 69 years old. This was it. 
but in its adopted home state of California, California, they vote on everything. They vote on pepperoni, on no pepperoni. <laughs> And they had on the ballot in 1978 a particularly pernicious idea called the Briggs Amendment. State Senator John Briggs, Republican from Orange County, had introduced a referendum question initiative that prohibited, made illegal, anybody teaching in the public schools of California who happened to be gay or lesbian. Not for any action, not for anything, but for being gay or lesbian. Similar measures had been adopted in Dade County, Florida, St. Paul, Minnesota, Wichita, Kansas, and even Eugene, Oregon. And it was leading the polls. And Ronald Reagan came out against it. And he said, that isn't how we judge teachers in California. We judge our teachers and whether our children learn in their classroom. And he turned it around. And it went out to defeat. And the Briggs Amendment lost. And that was the end of a mean-spirited movement. So I like politics and believe in politics. I don't like the kind of politics. I'm tired of people running for public office by running down the very government they seek to lead. But I know that Herb told me and told others and actually wrote it that John Kennedy was his favorite president. John Kennedy said, let the public service be a proud, and lively career. And let every man and every woman who works in every area of our national government, in any branch, at any level, be able to say, I serve the United States in what that hour of our nation's need. And so I believe in a politics, and I think Herb represented and embodied to me the kind of politics that took want and terror out of old age through Social Security and Medicare, the kind of politics that rebuilt in one of the most generous and unselfish acts in human history, rebuilt a devastated Europe and Japan after World War II and restored them, the kind of politics that reminds us every day that every one of us has been warmed by fires we did not build. Every one of us has drunk from wells we did not dig. Together, we can do no less, and together, working hard, we can do a lot more. And if you would honor her block, I would just ask you to, to do the following. To be brave, to be strong, to be kind, to make a child laugh, to stand up to the little guy and stand up to the big guy, and finally, to be brave. Thank you so much.